Whether you love pumpkin pie or you dread those family get-togethers, one thing's for sure, Thanksgiving is almost here. And you know what that means, right? No, I'm not talking about football or all the cooking and cleaning that goes into planning that perfect family gathering. I'm talking about all the extra work and stress that these things can place on us as early childhood professionals in the classroom. I'm preaching to the choir here because you and I both know that being an early childhood professional can feel like an impossible job on some days. And when all those extra things like parties and celebrations are piled on our plate during the holidays, it can feel like the straw that broke the camel's back. Case in point, here is a question I received from one of the students in my Teaching Trailblazers program. We'll call her Ashley. So she asked, I'm not sure what to do about Thanksgiving in my classroom. I don't think it's very meaningful to my preschoolers and they get so amped up about every little thing. I'm not sure they could handle a full-blown feast, but my principal wants us to have a Thanksgiving celebration. What should I do? Listen, I've been in this online preschool space for more than 20 years and I have been asked this question hundreds of times. And I'm here to tell you, Ashley, and everyone else who's listening, that you are not alone. There is a way to feel less stressed and lighten your load this Thanksgiving by teaching smarter and not harder. And I'm going to share just four easy steps to help you keep it real and simple in your classroom. Can I be real with you, Liz? But before we dive in, let me ask you a question. Did you know that there's a reason that I named this podcast Elevating Early Childhood? It's because the title embodies everything I stand for professionally. You see, I believe that all children deserve a high quality early childhood education. And in order to achieve that, we must first elevate the field of early childhood to the point where preschool is nationally recognized as a vital part of the educational process. Because I believe we can't get to the high quality point until the image and mindset about the importance of early childhood education have changed. And one of the ways I can help is to translate science-backed research and teaching best practices into actionable, attainable growth outcomes for teachers and ultimately students. So now that you know my why, here is a personal story to better illustrate my point. And this story may seem like it has nothing to do with Thanksgiving, but it's gonna come full circle, so keep listening. You see, when I graduated from college, teaching jobs were about as easy to come by as finding a rent control department in New York City. So I decided that I would go to Seoul, South Korea to teach. And during that time, my worldview started to shift as I experienced life as an expat. Now, fast forward to November, my first year back in the States teaching in the public school. And all the magazines in the teacher store that were hyper-focused on Thanksgiving and making headbands and paper bag vests with your kids. You get the picture, right? Now, remember, this was before the internet. This was back when teacher magazines were setting the trends in the classroom instead of social media. And I was left wondering, how on earth am I going to teach my students about Thanksgiving? And more importantly, should I even be teaching about it? because it just didn't make any sense to me to be teaching about these things in the classroom that weren't meaningful to my students. You see, in college, I had learned all about how young children learn from the concrete things they can see and touch, to the abstract things they can't see and touch. It's EC 101, right? So to me, it was obvious that the concept of Thanksgiving, not to mention the historical significance, was as abstract as you could get for young children. The idea of making headbands and vests and sitting down for a feast, none of that means anything to young children. Think about it. How many times have the kids in your classroom actually experienced Thanksgiving? So let's pretend that you teach four-year-olds and this is their fourth year. It's, and it's gonna happen in your classroom. So we haven't had Thanksgiving yet. So that leaves three Thanksgivings that they have experienced. One as an infant, so let's say they don't remember that. Then another when they were two years old. Not every kid remembers when they were two years old. In fact, most of them don't. So that means maybe they remember the Thanksgiving from last year, maybe they don't. But that's really just one time that they may or may not remember. 
that this has ever happened in their lives? And did they know why everyone in their family was maybe getting together? Because let's be honest here, not everyone celebrates Thanksgiving, right? The bottom line is that our time in the classroom is much better spent teaching the way young children's brains learn best. And that's by teaching what's meaningful to them, things that they can see and touch. Now we'll get into the whole, what should I do instead portion shortly, but first allow me to introduce you to REAL, that's R-E-E-L, and it stands for R, remember the brain research, E, embrace the position statement, the second E is engage with meaning, and the L stands for let go of the mindset that this is the way we've always done it. So I invite you to keep it real in your classroom this Thanksgiving. And I know that there are some of you out there who are nodding along in agreement as you're listening to this. And if that's you, thank you for being a champion for children. But I also know that there are some of you out there listening who may be angry that I'm challenging the way that you've always done things in the classroom. And that's okay because change is messy. Change is hard. And I really believe that when we know better, we do better. So back to our real acronym and that first letter R, which stands for remember the research, we already know that young children learn from the concrete to the abstract. So what this tells us is that the story of the first Thanksgiving is not developmentally appropriate because it's too abstract. I mean, think about it like this. If the concept of yesterday, tomorrow, next month, Next year, if those concepts are too abstract for young children in preschool, then obviously historical events are going to be even more meaningless to them. Listen, you are not a bad American or unpatriotic if you don't teach about the first Thanksgiving story in your preschool classroom. What you are is an early childhood professional who is demonstrating their knowledge and understanding of child development and putting their students first instead of falling into this is what we've always done trap. The next letter in our real acronym is E, which stands for embrace the position statement. And this one is proof that it's not just little old me out here advocating for a change in the way things are done in the early childhood classroom. The National Association for the Education of Young Children, or NACI for short, has an entire position statement on equity and diversity. In case you're not familiar, NACI is considered the gold standard of high-quality early childhood education here in the U.S. Their position statement clearly outlines what equity and diversity means and what it looks like in today's early childhood classroom. So I encourage you to not only read, but share this position statement with your friends, colleagues, directors, administrators, or anybody who works with young children. There's a link to it in the video description box below along with some other fantastic links to help support a socially responsible Thanksgiving in your classroom this year. So that brings me to the third letter in our acronym. That's another E, which stands for engage with meaning. This is the portion where I share what to do instead, so don't bail on me. So we're going to teach what's meaningful to your kids. Let me ask you a question. Do you read books aloud in your classroom? And are your kids used to you reading books aloud? So why not read some books written by Native American authors? We do have a Thanksgiving book list, which you can find in the video description box below if you're watching. And if you're listening, go to prekpages.com and type Thanksgiving books in the search box. And we do have some of these books written by Native Americans on that list. So reading books by Native Americans is one way that you can infuse your classroom with developmentally appropriate um, cultural reading. And this book is um, written by Kevin Noble Maillard, who is a member of the Seminole Nation. And fry bread, in case you're not familiar, is a, a treat enjoyed by many Native American people. And it would be really fun to even try fry bread in your classroom. But it's a very sweet story about little children And another book that you might consider reading is We Are Grateful by Tracy Sorrell. And she is a member of the Cherokee Nation. And this one is a very developmentally appropriate read aloud, talking about things that 
uh, this Native American tribe that they are uh, writing about is thankful for and are grateful for. And that is something that we talk about during this Thanksgiving season. But again, you're um, lifting up Native Americans, right? Instead of being stereotypical. So these are just two of the books on that book list. You can go and check out the whole list. And there's books about turkeys and stuff there as well. You can also look at Native American art with your students. So you can look at the art in a whole group lesson where you're talking about what you see and what they think it means and the colors and the shapes and all of that great stuff. Then you can put the art, where it's probably just a picture of it, right, in your art center for inspiration. And I'm not talking about any kind of directed drawing or anything like that at all. I'm just talking about inspiration and highlighting Native Americans as contributing to our culture through their art. Let's face it, young children are very egocentric, am I right? Things that are meaningful to them, aside from themselves, are their families and their friends. So why not talk about some of our favorite foods that we eat with our families? I like personally to sneak in a little nutrition during this time of the year and a lesson or two here and there, um, setting them up for success with something that I'll do later uh, which is my friendship salad, which we'll get to in a minute. During this time where we're usually learning about fruits like cranberries and pumpkins and vegetables like corn and wheat. So we might do a little taste testing of pumpkin seeds or cranberries and graph those results. And if you're allowed, you might have students explore cranberries, pumpkin seeds or corn in your sensory table. Tasting and exploring will engage your students in meaningful learning about relevant topics instead of abstract concepts. So speaking of friends, an important part of being a good friend is sharing. So we create that friendship salad that I talked about. This has nothing to do with Thanksgiving or the Thanksgiving story and everything to do with teamwork and friendship. So basically, I ask the children in my classroom to contribute something, or if you're in a situation where that isn't possible, I gather the different supplies, I pass them out to the children, and then we all contribute to making it. You can see a picture here on the screen, but if you want real details about how it works, um, you can go to the blog post, which is linked in the video description below, or you can type friendship salad into the search box at pre-K pages. Now, none of these things that I just described to you are dismissive of history. What they are, are hallmarks of an early childhood professional. And that brings me to the final letter in our acronym REAL. And that's the letter L, which stands for let go of the way we've always done it mindset. Listen, there are some things we've done in the early childhood classroom for a long time because they're considered best teaching practice and they're supported by research. Take finger plays for one. And then there are things that we've done in the early childhood classroom forever just because that's the way we've always done them. We have to consider the new research that has shed light on the way young children's brains learn best. The best teachers are lifelong learners. It's just part of being an early childhood professional. We have to embody that role to its fullest. And we have to let go of outdated thinking and outdated teaching practices that hold us and our students back. And yes, over the years, there were times when there were classes right down the hall from me that were having a giant feast. And there I was on the other side of the hall in my classroom uh, making friendship salad. And guess what happened? Nothing. <laughs> no children were harmed in this process, pinky swear. I was simply teaching developmentally appropriate learning objectives that were clearly laid out in my state's pre-K standards. And the result, I had a lot less stress and pressure than those teachers down the hall. And that, my friends, is how you teach smarter and not harder. Now, you may be wondering what happens if parents complain that you're not having a feast, wearing headbands or vests or something like that. And my response is, in today's day and age, I guess anything is possible, really. But I don't see how parents complain if you're doing the job you were hired to do, right? And that's teach young children following your state or your program's standards. But if it were to happen, I think that would tell me that I hadn't done a good enough job communicating with my students' families. Now, you may also be wondering what would happen if your colleagues uh, question your choice to not participate in a Thanksgiving feast. And to be honest, 
I've always just shut my door and done my thing and nobody has said boo to me. Um, if I was offered paper grocery bags, I think I would just say thanks. And then I tuck them away for when I do my dramatic play uh, camping theme in May. And again, if I was questioned about my lack of participation in that, that would mean that I hadn't communicated well with my colleagues. That's just how I see it. So there you have it. Those are just four easy steps to keep it real and simple in your classroom this Thanksgiving. Just remember the acronym REAL, R-E-E-L, this Thanksgiving. And please share this episode with your colleagues and your administrators, your principals, your directors, really anyone who works in early childhood, share this episode with them. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, Onward and Upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.